Faraday, presented by Cobra Golf. Oh man, that is not gonna work. I got the Donald in five minutes and no, no. Round and round and round. So the Justin Bieber's not working. <clears throat> now that is really beautiful hair. I never hear that. This thing is magic. <laughs> Political fiction. I love it. You know, the more time I spend around this idiotic game of golf, the more I realize it's a great equalizer. There's a huge cross-section of the population loves and plays the game from paupers to presidents. And while most of my time is spent blundering around serious professionals pretending I've got a clue what they're doing, I do from time to time have the opportunity to interact with people who just love the game. But when I heard that tonight's guest was also looking for his very first major, that was enough to get me on a plane. And we all know just how much I adore traveling. Not. I was going to make my way to a city bigger than Dallas. No, Frank. I said bigger than Dallas. Not better. You need to watch your nuggets. Here I am in Gotham City, the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. New York, New York, a city so important that you've got to say its name twice. This is Times Square, a place that changes color and shape so often that I might have an epileptic fit. But this city isn't the only thing with two names. Have you ever heard of the Big D? I thought that was Dallas, but not here. The Donald, the Trumpster, and a couple of other names that I probably can't mention on television. New York is about the only city that can contain the size of the personality that Donald Trump has. As a billionaire real estate developer, he just keeps getting bigger. He's buying golf courses, he's buying properties, he's managing things, he has a television show. Hold on a minute. I'm vibrating. Oh, it's the Donald. He says I've forgotten a few things. Bear with me. Real estate developer, broker, hotelier, golf course developer, and avid golfer, best-selling author, Emmy-nominated television star with the number one rated multi-season shows, radio celebrity, restaurateur, model manager, pageant partner, merchandiser, promoter, philanthropist. He's a supermodel snaring husband, father, and grandfather, and those are just the bits we know about. It's not easy hanging around with someone who's accomplished more in the last five minutes than you're liable to in your entire life, but I'm going to take a shot at it. All right, let's see now. Trump Tower. I guess the odds are pretty good that this is the place. I've got to get myself one of these one day. Verity Tower. I like the sound of that. Probably turn out more like Baldy Towers, though. Um, Mr. Trump, or may I call you the Donald? Absolutely. Whatever you want. I'll even drop the the. Okay. Oh, well, normally... Um, I, uh, I bring my guests some kind of a gift, and in, in your case, I thought it would be appropriate if I brought uh, an inflatable Rosie O'Donnell. The problem is that we started inflating her a couple of days ago, and she's not ready yet. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, so we, not good. we'll have to wait, and it's another an issue <laughs> is whether or not we can get her in the elevator, but I'll, I'll get her to you. Um, we're here in uh, Trump Tower, kind of your landmark property. It's got the most amazing view over New York, the whole of Central Park, uh, in every direction, it's unbelievable. What is it about New York? Why, why do you love it? Well, it's a special place, David. It's got tremendous energy, it's got great people, 
Uh, you know, when you hear a World Trade Center, two 110-story buildings coming down, and within a few months it was terrible loss of life, billions and billions and probably trillions of damage, and yet within a few months the city was boom, boom, boom and rebuilding again. And it's just got a great energy and just great people. In your tenure as uh, one of America's captains of, of uh, admirals of industry, if you like, you know, you've, you've made a pants load of money, lost a pants load of money, made it again. What do you think your uh, fair share of taxes is? Well, I pay a lot of tax. I can I tell imagine. you that. And, uh, you know, many, many, many millions of dollars. And I'm happy to do it. What I do think is that I would like to see the money spent more wisely. When I build a project or when I do anything I do, I have budgets and I have costs and I have places where I want to spend the money. I want to spend the money here. I want to spend the money there. And it's very exacting. And when I look at this country, we don't know what we're doing. We have a $15 trillion, which is really going to be soon $16 trillion deficit. The money is going out on all sides. And, you know, when they talk about raising taxes, do I mind raising? I don't mind anything as long as they can get their expenses under control, which they haven't been able to do. And the country is really in trouble, big trouble. Is that one of the reasons that uh, you decided that uh, you'd put your name in the hat uh, running for president? Well, I looked into the possibility of doing it, and I was leading in the polls. I was leading in all of the polls. And in fact, when I decided not to do it, because between NBC and everybody else that was putting tremendous pressure to do the show, The Apprentice, to do all of the different things I'm doing, and buying Doral and buying lots of other things. I have a lot of life. How, and to be, to how be do honest, you manage well, all it's sort of, of interesting. But I loved running. I'm also well acquainted with winning, and that's what this country needs now, winning. And you know, when you're a businessman, especially when you're a big businessman, it's very hard to sort of give up your life and give up everything you've been doing. When you're a politician, you run for office, you lose, or you win. Then you go into the next one, you lose, or you win. Well, and you also have a tremendous searchlight shone right up your kilt. Especially when I got to the top of the polls, I was getting articles that were unbelievable, that had nothing to do with the truth, and they're just writing stuff. And you have your people call the reporter, because at this point you realize the reporter's so dishonest, so you have the right people call, and they don't really want to hear the truth. And you know, it's very interesting where the public, they do polls, and the, pl the public is not a big believer in the press, which tells you the public is really pretty smart. But certain things were said, it's not even relevant, but they were so dishonest and knowingly dishonest. So being a politician is not easy. And when you do well with it, it's certainly not easy. People think I love to fire people, but I actually don't. It's a dirty job. I mean, you've got to make decisions that, uh, that are gonna affect other people's lives that are tough. Well, it's a really fair question. It's a tough question because you have so many different things. Do you spend here and not spend there? First of all, we have to take care of our people and we have to take care of this country. And the country really isn't being taken care of right now because we're going to become a not so great country in the not too distant future. And some people would say we've already hit that number. Empires rise and they fall? They do, but I would like to see ours continue to rise or at least stay the same and mm. not go in the wrong direction. And you know, when they talk about Medicare, when they talk about Social Security, when they talk about lots of good things, positive things, that's great, but you have to have a country that's a wealthy country. You can't have a country that's a poor country. We're a debtor nation. We borrow money from China and other places to stay afloat. There's no reason for that. We have unbelievable potential if we knew how to use it, and we don't know how to use it. I'm in deep trouble, because I owe this man, it's meaning his bank, tens and tens of millions of dollars. Do you like the limelight? Mark Burnett called and he said, I have this idea that I'll only do if you do it. It's called The Apprentice. You know, they tell me the best way to see New York is to stay off the beaten path. I'm not in Texas anymore, so I can't carry my 45, and this certainly looks like uh, the sort of path I might get beaten on. Oh boy, not so good. Donald's dad, Fred Trump, ignored the beaten path and took the one less traveled. Born in 1905 in Queens, New York, Fred wasted no time chasing the American dream. He began building at age 15, founding a store in Woodhaven, New York for his family. 
Undaunted by tough economic times, he went on to develop apartment buildings, homes and high-rises, becoming a multi-millionaire. In 1936, he married a lovely Scot named Mary MacLeod. One thing led to another and in 1946 they created a baby, Donald J. Trump. Donald learned everything about construction from his dad, who became his mentor and business partner. And although he wasn't an avid golfer, Fred introduced the game of golf to his son, instilling a love for the game that would last a lifetime. Fred Trump was often known to say that some of the best deals he made were actually done by his son, and that everything Donald touched turned to gold. Then came the day that Donald went out on his own, into the very different world of Manhattan real estate, where things went very well. Very, very well. Tell me something about your early childhood memories. I know that your father was a huge influence and, and you went into business with him. Well, he was. He was a builder in Brooklyn and Queens primarily, and I learned a lot from my father. He was a really good builder, knew how to build on time, on budget. He got it done. He's an endangered species? That's right. You don't see it often nowadays when you look at what goes on. But no kidding. He was really a wonderful guy and a wonderful mentor. And he was also potentially a very good golfer. It was very interesting. He didn't play golf. But I remember playing with him once. We went out to a public course in Queens called Forest Park, and I had never played. But what I remembered about him was he was very talented. I mean, he probably played 10 rounds of golf in his life, but he had a great swing. And he could have really been a good golfer if he played, but he didn't play. But I was impressed by his game. Do you remember the first business deal that you did with your dad? I mean, you became partners. I did, and I was uh, actually going to high school, and I'd help him. But when I was in college, I went out to Cincinnati, Ohio. I worked out there on a certain job called Swifton Village, and I turned it around. I really did a good job, and it was sort of over the summer, but I worked very hard, and I loved it. I loved real estate from the beginning. I like taking something, and if it's a sick puppy, that's good because I make it better. You went to a really good college. Right, the it, Wharton School of Finance. It's not yeah. easy to get in there. No, it's not. Where, where did you get that acumen? Well, I guess maybe you're born with something, but Wharton is a great school. I think it's probably the best school, probably the hardest school to get into. It was sort of interesting because a lot of the people that are the big successes today, they went to Wharton, and you competed against them at a young age, and you felt you did very well against them, and it gives you a little confidence. Almost more than what you learn, it gives you confidence to win. Winning is a wonderful thing, but it gives you confidence to win. What, what constitutes a win for Donald Trump? Well, I've watched and I've studied that word for many years, and in the end, it's really your own happiness, because I know many people that are very, very successful, friends, enemies, very, very successful, and in some cases, they're extremely unhappy. Then I know people that aren't successful or not very successful, and they are happy. They have a great family, they have, you know, they, they just, in my opinion, they're much happier. So I would say those people maybe are the winners. It's not all about success, but those people probably are the winners, David. Depression, the best way I can uh, describe it is when the immune system in your head goes down. I didn't know that about you, but you're doing amazingly well. Oh, I'm seriously not right. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think was... you're great. I happen to love this guy. I am a member of Wingfoot. Uh, Who do you play with there? Jim Nance is a member. Jim Nance is a great guy, and I he think is. he is such a terrific announcer. And I was actually honored in Westchester. I guess I'm breaking into this whole thing, but I was honored with Jim Nance uh, recently in Westchester, and they honored me, of all things, the family of the year. Can you believe that? Me, the family of the year. I've come a long <laughs> way. I didn't think that was even possible. But Which one of your terrific. families were they talking about? Nah, that's the, that was going to be my next question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've written several books. Is there a, a sense of personal achievement? Do you do that uh, for the record, if you like? Well, I wrote a book in 1987, 
called The Art of the Deal, which was the biggest selling business book, to my understanding, of all time. And it's still a big selling book. And it was a great honor to be number one many, many, many weeks in every list, the New York Times list, every list, for many, many weeks. And over the years, I've now written 11 books, and they've all done great. Where do you find the time? What I do is I bring people with me. If I make a speech, I bring people, and we mark down things. Right. And then we compile everything at the end of a year, and we come out with a book. Right. And it does well. But I figure that's better than sitting down for a period of three days and trying to knock out a book. You know, you do it during the course of a year. Lots of interesting things happen. Lots mm. of things happen that you never thought could happen. And, and so I've done 11 that, books, and they've been great. That you don't remember that those other people might recall? Well, that's true. That's true. That happens to me all the time. Yeah. You bring the right people, they recall lots of different yeah. things. So it's You've sort of, seen my people. What are the odds? There is a great thing to books, though, and there's something prestigious about it to me. And I also, you know, I've, I've done a lot. And I think I've learned a lot. And I like to impart that knowledge to people. If people can read a book and learn something and have a better life because of it, have make more money because of it, uh, do better, take care of their kids and the education and the medical, and I'm, that really makes me happy. So in 87, you write Trump, The Art of the Deal, you know, how to make money. And then in the early 90s, you discover how not to make it because, you know, it goes down the toilet a little while for you. How do you make it out of that? Well, it was interesting because the world absolutely was collapsing and the real estate markets just were tanking all over the world, but in this country in particular, and it was tough, the early 90s. And one story that I relate to people about golf, there was one banker who was really looking to do bad numbers on me. And I was playing this day and they said, we need another person. And this guy was at the course. It was the weirdest thing. I mean, not a member, not... And they said, would you like to join the group? And he joined. When he saw he was in the group, he wanted to get out. But then he decided to join. He was a terrible golfer. Terrible. And a villainous banker? And a villainous. He was not a friend of mine. But I said, you know what? You'll be in, it'll be you and I. Let's see how we do. And he starts off, I say, I'm in deep trouble. Because I owe this man, meaning his bank, tens and tens of millions of dollars. So he starts off by topping the first ball. Topping the, he was horrible for two, three holes. And he had a terrible grip. He had a very weak grip. And I said, you know, do me a favor. Just take your hands and put the V to the shoulder. Strengthen your grip. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. The guy ends up hitting a ball as well as he can hit it, 20 feet out to the right and hooks back in, which I consider the nicest shot. Oh, well. Forget about the power fades and all of that. I mean, I love it when they go out and come back, okay? I like them, boom. So he hits this ball. He said, I've never hit a shot like that. Then he hits another one, same thing. Starts out to the right, hooks back in. He ends up playing the best round he's ever played, hit the ball the best he's ever played, goes to the range afterwards, hits balls all day long. He couldn't believe that he actually is hitting the ball well. And he sees me the next day and he goes, could we work it all out, come on? We had lunch, I worked it out with him in about 10 minutes. Without golf, that wouldn't have happened. And who knows, maybe I wouldn't be sitting here. Who knows? So well, golf I, I is pretty good. I suspect you'd be sitting here. I yeah. don't know, but he was a lot nicer after I got to be his partner at a golf match. <laughs> Do you think there's more chance of you getting a Ryder Cup over there? I think it's more likely that I get a major. There are a lot of people that, that think that you're a world-class That's true. I mean, does that bother you? <laughs> Do you like the limelight? David, people think I like the limelight, and the truth is, uh, probably sometimes I do, but sometimes I would love to be able to walk outside. You know, in the old days, I'd walk the streets of New York and I'd see things that I liked and I'd make moves on them, and I can't do that anymore. I don't have those moments where I can just go to the park or do something. It's not quite as simple as that. Donald Trump and his lovely wife, Melania. I think a lot of that had to do with the great success of The Apprentice, frankly. Did you ever see yourself hosting uh, one of the most successful shows of all time? I never saw it happen. I never thought it could happen. How did it happen? Well, I had great success. And 
I was then presented with an opportunity. But in the meantime, I do a Larry King or I do shows. I do Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes. Right. They interviewed me a couple of times. And I'd get very good ratings for whatever reason. You know, they have these minute by minutes, right, yes. where they spike. Yes. So all of a sudden, people see that. Television people are smart, entertainment people. And they say, well, let's get Trump here. So I kept getting lots of calls to do television. And Mark Burnett called, and he said, I have this idea that I'll only do if you do it. It's called The Apprentice. So we did the show, and it started at 10, and went to 8, and went to 5, and went to 4 and 3, and then it became the number one show on many evenings. I mean, it became this monster success. And NBC started calling, happy birthday, Donald. And I didn't know anything. All I knew was, gee, why is the head of NBC calling and wishing me happy birthday? I said, that must mean the show is doing very well. <laughs> anyway, it's been an amazing show. It's in many, many countries now. but. It has totally taken away any semblance of private life that I've had. Have you ever uh, been in a situation where you've known that uh, if you create a little controversy, it's going to work to your advantage? I don't think I do it consciously, but it seems to happen. I mean, controversy always seems to follow me. And sometimes that's a good thing. I get calls from people in Paris. I get calls from people in New York. They read about this or that. And I think it's actually been a very great positive. So sometimes controversy can be good. Not always, but sometimes I think controversy can be very good. Thank you, Arnold. That was an honor. Great. What does it mean to you to be able to get back? Well, I just think it's very important. There's so many people. When I look at ourselves sitting up here with these beautiful views and everything else, and then all you have to do is turn on the evening news and you see the kind of travesty and tragedy that's going on all over the world. And I just think it's very important to give back. You know, it's all very fragile. This is very fragile. Oh, Life yeah. is very fragile. And it makes me feel good to give. Speaking of the evening news, it's the only program where they start with good evening and then tell you exactly why it isn't. Yeah, that's a very interesting yeah. statement. It's tragic. When you look at some of the news, especially, I don't know, I guess it's always been that way, but lately it's just disaster. You watch it. It's really depressing. Disaster yeah. after. How often do you see a good story? Like, never. Apparently it's not news, uh, and there was a period in my life uh, where I, you know, I was extremely sick that I, I couldn't watch the news. I became so overwhelmed with, with sadness. I mean, depression is a disease that uh, you, your body has an immune system. Depression, the best way I can uh, describe it is when the immune system in your head goes down. And all of those things that you watch in the news that you can let brush off you, and uh, you know, it, all of a sudden it becomes your child that was molested, or your right. son that was beheaded, wow. or, or whatever, and, and you cannot get rid of it. You know, so... Um, well, you're doing amazingly well. I didn't know that about you, but you're doing amazingly well. Oh, I'm seriously not right. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think was, you're great. I, I happen to love this guy. I, I think was, and I love your show, too, so it's an honor kind. to be with you. You yeah. know what, though? That's interesting stuff because that's life. Yeah. And I have many friends. I actually have this a large group of people, friends that I have that are great people, but they do suffer these tremendous bouts of depression. Oh, there's, there's a lot more of it around. Yeah. Than, than, and people and there's understand. a stigma that goes with it because it's a mental illness and people have that, you know, they're ashamed of it and they, and they don't get treated as a result. Uh, Mike Wallace uh, from uh, uh, 60 Minutes and CBS, a tremendous hero, hero of mine. Um, Friend what, of mine. He, yeah. He did a 60 minute piece on me. Yeah. And he got a lot of heat because it was so good. It was such a positive piece. I loved Mike Wallace. I thought there was nobody like him. Yeah. But you're right. He suffered massive depression. Yeah, great man. There is one mistake you can make in New York that could possibly prove fatal. Right. Seriously, dude? I hate the Yankees. Donald, we're canceling The Apprentice because the ratings are no good. You know, pretty much every big city has their guide, you know, telling you what you might or might not do. I'll give you a short, unofficial guide of what you shouldn't and can't do in New York. When you get into a yellow cab, if your driver... Also, I agree with you in some cases, but in some cases it's a talent. You have some of these, as an example, a couple of young ladies who I know them all. I know every one of them. I believe you. And they, well... In a very positive sense, but <laughs> they make a big business out of 
being a celebrity. They'll get paid $50,000 to go to the opening of a club. They'll get paid $100,000 to be at the ribbon cutting for some club. What is it that sets them apart? Because there are a lot of beautiful right. young girls. More beautiful. Yeah. They get nothing. Yeah. More beautiful. But there are family connections and... No, and it just works. You don't know why. Sometimes I'll look at somebody, I'm not using names, but every one of them I know very well. And I'll say, I don't get it. I don't get it. What? What's, uh, you could look at the room and you'll see 25 more women that are f far more beautiful. Mm -hmm. But see that thing over there, it's called a camera? It just registers, right. it works. And for whatever reason, you may not see great beauty or great anything or great brain power, but for whatever reason, people watch. And if people watch, you know, your business that you're now in in a very good way and doing very well, by the way, in terms of ratings and everything else, and I'm proud of you, but your business that you're now in, it's all about ratings. Yeah. It's very interesting. I was hosting Saturday Night Live, and Lorne Michaels, who's a total pro, said to me, there was such hoopla and such craziness. Everybody was going crazy. And I said, you know, Lorne, someday it won't be like this. NBC will call me, and they'll say, Donald, we're canceling The Apprentice because the ratings are no good. He says, no, no, Donald, they won't even call. <laughs> There's a little twist to that. It's been like rats leaving a sinking ship recently, you know, people trying to get out of the golf development business, and yet you're the one that's been investing in it. What's the most misunderstood thing about you? How much do you delegate? Well, I have a lot of good people, and I probably have people that aren't so good, and usually I try and find them out as quickly as possible. You've got a lot of great people here. For a start, you know, Larry, uh, well, I walked in terrific. here and he said, no, that's not going to work. I've got to take you downstairs, and he put me in this suit. Is the it's the finest piece of clothing that I own. Well, I'm very impressed. I tell you, I walked in, I was very surprised to see this, but I'm very impressed. Larry made you do that. Well, exactly, and, and he made you pay for it, but I should well, probably have... Oh, uh, that's okay, too. Yeah. <laughs> probably shouldn't have mentioned that. Well, I tried to make it out of the Donald's office with a Renoir, but... That didn't work out, so I'm on the street. Thought I might as well take this chance to read uh, this week's email. This is from uh, Rosemary Trosper, honestly. Dear Mr. Faherty, it's just Faherty, Rosemary. I really enjoy your interview programs. Of course you do, you're only human. You have interesting guests, mostly, in parentheses, and you are very entertaining to watch. I have one complaint, however, and that is your hair this season looks terrible. You mean it was okay last season? You desperately need a shampoo and cut. My hair is clean, all right? It might need a snip here and there. You're a handsome man. And messy hair should not distract from that. If your stylist suggested this look for you, I would find a new stylist. If this is your idea, I hope to see improvement in upcoming shows. Thank you for your time, Rosemary Trosper. Well, Rosemary, I've got to tell you, with the time constraints that my job places upon me and the difficulty of finding a barber shop, you know, or a hair salon that's, you know, willing to do this kind of a thing, you know, take on this sort of a task, I just can't find either the time or the location. So it's pretty much going to stay like this. You've always had a love of sport. You know, golf seems to be right at the top of the list at the minute, but you know, you played football, you played baseball, you played soccer um, at school and at college. Why was it that you chose golf, you know, in the end? Well, I always really enjoyed sports, playing it. I love watching sports, but I've always been involved with sports. And you know, when you get out of college or high school, if you were, I was always captain of my baseball teams and I, was, I, I always did well with sports. I was a good athlete which really surprises people. But now you get to a certain age where you don't have 18 people you can get together or you don't have 22 people to get together. And the great thing about golf, I found, is you can play with people that are phenomenal or terrible and you can have a great match. It's one of the great handicapping sports of all time. You get four strokes, you get five strokes, you give 10 strokes. But I always enjoyed golf and I've had a lot of fun with golf. Oh, partner, we're gonna like that, partner. It just gave me a release. And then I started doing the whole thing 12 years ago with golf courses. Make a big high tee over here. Okay. Make it high. 
It's been like rats leaving a sinking ship recently, you know, people trying to get out of the golf development business, and yet you're the one that's been investing in it. Well, I started building, I started in Palm Beach in Westchester, building from scratch courses. Then over the last four or five years, when the economy crashed, I started buying courses. I bought one, the phenomenal one, right next to Pine Valley, done by Tom Fazio, great. I bought two courses in Washington, right outside of Washington, three miles on the Potomac River. The most beautiful. Now, I blew them up and built something spectacular. So I had sort of have two phases. I did the original where I built, and then I bought for good discounts mm -hmm. from banks and out of different problems. Courses that could only be really great if I touched them up. We can keep it rustic, but not in a ballroom. I ordered uh, six chandeliers that are unbelievable, but this crap comes down, okay? Yes, sir. I hate these lockers, they're garbage. Because you ever see lockers like this? I'd take down the curtains now, by the way, uh, Eric. So I've had a lot of fun with it. I've enjoyed it. I think I've been very good for golf. I've saved some courses that would have been probably abandoned, and now they have tremendous memberships and everybody's happy. So I think I've done a good job for golf. I hope I've done a good job for golf. And while it's not my main business, I really enjoy it. I love the beauty of taking this piece of land and, and making it something special. I've always enjoyed that. Bedminster is one uh, of your golf courses in which I'm particularly interested. I've done a speaking engagement down there and I walked the golf course. It was gorgeous and heck, there are a number of, in the area, that golf course is, uh, there's a bunch of golf courses that would consider themselves to be possible PGA Championship venues or Ryder Cup venues. Why isn't a, a place like Bedminster under consideration? A very smart man in your profession said to me that if you want to have a U.S. Open... There aren't many of those. Not, not too many. But he actually said, we have a phenomenal complex as an example in Washington. It's called Trump National Golf Club, and it's in Washington, right outside of Washington. It's phenomenal, right along the Potomac, three miles on the Potomac River. He said, do you want to have a U.S. Open here? I said, I'd love it. Change the name. He said, you've got everything. Change the name. And I said to him, you know, you could be right. Now, at the same time, the course is booming. It's a tremendous success. Bedminster, Trump National Golf Club, Bedminster, New Jersey, booming. All of my courses are booming. Without the name, they don't boom. I really believe as great as Bedminster is, and some people think it's one of the best built in 25 years, as great as it is, I think the best reviews I've ever gotten on anything is a course that hasn't opened yet. It opens in July, and that's in Scotland. Oh, now that's the one I wanted to ask you about because there was one particular person whom I think uh, controlled a, a little piece of land. Are you talking about Mr. Forbes? The, yes, the, uh, the farmer. He controlled a piece of land, but it wasn't anywhere near the golf course. It was in a different area. But we tried to buy his land for an unrelated project because I have 2,000 acres. Oh, it was an unrelated project? Yes, it was an unrelated project. Now, where else are you putting teas here, Martin? I mean, the big thing that got publicity is when I bought the land, people said you'll never be able to build. They're the largest dunes in the world, the great dunes of Scotland. Oh, yeah. And they said you'll never be able to build Touchem because they were, they call it SSSI, that's scientifically protected. So when I bought the land, I'm a big boy, I took the land, I didn't take it subject to getting zoning because you wouldn't have been able to do that. Although I got a good price based on the fact that you wouldn't be able to do anything with the land, I then right. went in and got it zoned, much to the surprise of a lot of people. I never saw a course this tough before in my life. <laughs> it's gonna be amazing. Do you think there's more chance of you getting a Ryder Cup, not in this country, but maybe over there? Well, people have asked me that question. I think it's more likely that I get a major meaning I think I'll get a woman's U.S. Open in Bedminster. But I think I'm more likely to get a major in Scotland. The course in Scotland, will it be the McTrump International? Or? No, no, no. It's called Trump International Golf Links Scotland. And uh, it's located on 650 acres, which, as you know, is a tremendous That's a swat. big piece of land. It's right near Royal Aberdeen. And interestingly, for years I've heard Royal Aberdeen has the greatest nine holes anywhere in the world, with the same dune system. And that's, and I love Royal Aberdeen, and they were so supportive of me. I'm not sure I would have been if I were them. But when you see what we've built there, it will be something special. Mm. You know, for those of you that don't know where Aberdeen is, or this particular area, um, it, they call it the North Sea up there. It's actually the Arctic Circle. 
Yeah, the people in Aberdeen, they're not white people, they're pale blue. What's the most misunderstood thing about you, apart from your hair? Uh, there are a lot of people that, that think that you're a world-class That's true. Yeah. I mean, does that bother you? Um... If you had the choice, uh, say, 30, 40 years ago, of ending up as a world-class golfer or as a world-class real estate developer, uh, which would you have chosen? Well, I love my life now. I mean, I love what I'm doing with golf, but it's not a big part of my life, relatively speaking. And one of the reasons, I employ thousands of people. I take care of their educations indirectly. I mean, I pay salaries to the husband or to the wife, and lots of health, lots of educations, lots of care is given to that family. And that makes me happy. And I wouldn't be obviously doing that if I were even an extremely good golfer. So I'm very happy with where I am right now. I don't like the bottle, I don't like the size, I don't like the label. Other than that, it's <laughs> Get smart, use your brain, okay? You know what, who cares? Get it done and don't spend a lot. How about this? In order to be world class at anything, you, you have to have a high opinion of yourself. And quite often that can be confused with, with arrogance. You know, uh, there are a lot of people that, that think that you're a world class It's true. Yeah, but, it's true. you know, I mean, does that bother you? No, I think that when I meet people, they feel that I'm a much different person. I know a lot of people don't like me, but they don't know me. Nice right. And I'll hear, oh, so-and-so cannot stand you, but I've never met him. And then sometimes I'll get to meet these people or even get to know them, and they actually like me. So I, I think it's probably um, a positive. By the way, Ron Paul cannot get elected. <laughs> Just going back to politics for one moment, do you think the current system is dissuading intelligent people for putting themselves up for, for election? Absolutely. You have some people that are unbelievable people, running corporations, people that you know, people that you deal with in the golf world. Mm. But people running companies that are phenomenal leaders, phenomenally brilliant, they've done deals, they've won, 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 they win all the time. But in winning, they may have been a little tough. They may have been a little this or that. They will be brutalized. And it's a bad, pro you know, it's a rough process. I don't know of any other process, but it's a rough process. And I know a lot of people would be great in politics, but they could never go through the kind of scrutiny. Not that they've done anything wrong, but the press can be very dishonest and they'll make them look like they've done things wrong. What do you want for your children? I mean, your father came from nothing and was successful, and, and you learned from him. What, what do you want them to learn from you? I would say that you know, I built a tremendous company, stronger, bigger, better than it's ever been before. And what I would like to see is for my children, not so much to expand it, just to keep it going really well. What's the most misunderstood thing about you, apart from your hair, which is uh, you know, it's like the space-time continuum. Most people know what it is, but they just, you know, they can't explain it. I do take heat on it. It is mine, you know. It's, oh, I know? This is my hair. I know. But I would say the people that don't know me think I'm a pretty rough guy and not a good guy. And I think that I am actually a good person. I do have heart. I do see people in trouble, and I really like to help them. And I understand trouble. I understand how to help people. And, you know, I think I'm a much nicer, basically, to simplify it, I think I'm a much nicer person than people would think. That's probably bad for my image, but I believe it's true. Who gets the keys to the kingdom when you croak? Does Rosie have any chance? No, Rosie won't have a chance, but I do believe in children, and I have great children, and hopefully by that time they'll be all set and they'll be, you know, good at what they do. And on the, the Trump tombstone, what would you like it to say? Well, I, I think really... I told you I was sick? No, I th yeah, well, that's, that's another one. But I think really that he did a great and quality job. Quality is very important to me. I mean, whether it's what I do in the buildings and the towers or the golf courses, it's always got to be the best. It's always got to be top quality. And so I add the word, so it's great and quality job. It's quite clearly you're doing a pretty good job there. I really appreciate you well, taking the time you, to spend with me.
on Faraday. Great honor. Thank you very really much. Great honor. Thank you That's, very much. You know, you've got low standards as well. I like that. <laughs> I think my favorite Donaldism is, in the end, you're measured not by how much you undertake, but by what you finally accomplish. This simple tenet can be applied to just about anything, whether it's building a multi-billion dollar empire or scratching your ass on the sofa. I know which I'd be best at. It was an honor and a lot of fun to spend time with the Donald, and not because he's rich and famous and rich, although that did help. No, rather because he's just a seriously abnormal person. A man with hopes, ideas, dreams, and goals so big they seem impossible to realize. But somehow, the Donald convinces you he has both the means and the massive cojones required to make them happen. The Trump name is already an icon. Everyone knows it, and they think they know the man who owns it, along with what seems to be like most of Midtown. And in a city as big as New York, that in itself is one an extra large achievement. That's our show for tonight. Oh, and Rosemary. By the way, I sorted out my hair problem, as you can see. Turns out I didn't have to cut my hair. If you get into enough cabs in New York, it'll fall out. Good night, sweetie. The Swingnook XL clips on the most shoelaces, or lets you tether the thing off. <laughs>